All right, everyone, we're going to jump in. I want to honor your time. My name is Dana Parsons. I'm the Director of Grants and Professional Development here at the Maryland State Arts Council. And uh, today is part of our Professional Development and Vision Series, uh, specifically which came out of the uh, Governor's Declared State of Emergency, which um, is a several different professional development opportunities linked together with this idea of envisioning the future and focusing on possibilities rather than kind of sitting in the mud. Um, next slide, please, Lillian. Um, and so today we're specifically going to be focusing on our folk life team um, as we meet uh, the team of traditional arts here at the Maryland State Arts Council. So just a quick word about uh, the platform that we're using, Google Meet. To mute or resume your audio, you'll hit the mute button on the bottom left of center. And if you're calling in today, it's star six to mute and unmute. Similarly for video, um, the video button is on the bottom right of center. Uh, we ask that you remain muted uh, unless you are speaking just in order to minimize the background noise. In the upper right hand corner of your meeting screen is the tab for the chat box and we'll be um, monitoring the chat box throughout the meeting. So uh, if you'd like to use that as a way to communicate that works too and know that chat messages will be displayed for all attendees. And um, if we uh, discuss any uh, links or URLs, we'll place those in the chat box for you to click as well. You can turn on captions on the bottom right of the screen. Google captions is occasionally accurate. Um, so we'll just leave it with that disclaimer. And uh, the live captioning will differentiate for you which attendee is speaking. To leave the meeting, you can press the phone icon at the bottom center of the screen. And if you've downloaded an app to go with Google Meet, um, here's just a quick reference shot of features um, so that you can uh, raise your hand, um, share the meeting details with anyone else, um, et cetera. So just uh, we begin all of our meetings here at the Maryland State Arts Council with just a couple of grounding slides um, so that you can see how it connects to the bigger picture of our work. Um, if for accessibility best practices, I will read the slides aloud. Our equity and justice statement, the Maryland State Arts Council celebrates our state's diversity and promotes the role of the arts to connect people, bridge our differences, and inspire an appreciation of our shared humanity. Because the arts have the power to transform individuals and communities, MSAC is committed to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of our and across all the communities of our state and in supporting our partners in modeling the same commitment. Our vision, MSAC plays an essential role ensuring every person has access to the transformative power of the arts and mission. MSAC advances the arts in our state by providing leadership that champions creative expression, diverse programming, equitable access, lifelong learning, and the arts as a celebrated contributor to the quality of life for all the people of Maryland. And our uh, strategic planning goals, to increase participation, provide intentional support, build capacity, leverage connections, and bolster Maryland arts. With today's work specifically, we're really looking at uh, goal two, four, and five. And finally, um, as we uh, enter into conversation with one another later in uh, today's meeting, we follow these uh, creative meeting actions to celebrate being in this space with other creative people, to engage with everyone's presence as a gift, acknowledge that together we know a lot, enter the conversation with curiosity and inquiry, share your idea and trust that it will be heard, use I statements, focus your language on the task at hand, hold one another accountable with care, apply yes and, I hear your idea and I'm going to add to it, and balance speaking and listening. So um, I'll now introduce Chad Buderbaugh, our state folklorist at the Maryland State Arts Council. Chad? Thanks, Dana, and thanks as always for being behind the scenes on this whole Envision series. It's a heavy lift and we're very appreciative for your efforts. Uh, my name's Chad. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'll get into a fuller introduction a little bit later, but just to start us off, 
Uh, the traditional arts are an art form that often requires a little bit of explanation and how we conceive of them and um, how we see them in our everyday lives. So our definition at MSAC of the traditional arts is right here. We're talking about community-based living cultural traditions that are handed down by example or word of mouth. And that is really a kind of definition that it takes in a lot of different art forms so that the traditional arts could be about performance or they could be about craft or material objects and they could even be about customs and rituals and beliefs. Um, so here are just a few slides like for example we have uh, a traditional indigenous round dance being portrayed here by Rico Newman of George's County, member of the Piscataway tribe and uh, this is a, an example of a traditional arts that again gets the body moving, is connected to uh, many, many generations of, of practice here in the place that is now known as Maryland. Um, next slide, please, Lillian. Uh, traditional arts could also refer to uh, sung forms of arts. So here we have the traditional Ethiopian music and dance group, uh, Yebel Hodankira Budin, which is based in Montgomery County, uh, doing a performance um, and uh, this sort of points to the fact, too, that in our traditional arts program uh, at the Maryland State Arts Council, we support traditions that, that um, are coming from cultures that haven't necessarily been here for centuries, you know, relatively recent arrivals like our Ethiopian diaspora around D.C. are very much uh, welcome and we're very excited to, to have them be part of our programming. Uh, next slide. Traditional arts can also refer to performances from uh, the other side of the world in some uh, circumstances. The Samonori tradition of Korea is uh, being represented here by Sebastian Wong of uh, Washington Samonori. He's based in Prince George's County, I want to say. Next slide, please. And uh, here we have uh, traditional art that is relatively new. It's only about 25 to 30 to 35 years old called Baltimore Club. Uh, it's a form of dance music uh, that sort of arose from Baltimore City in the 1980s and early 1990s based on DJs just kind of working at home and developing distinctive beats that gained a lot of popularity on the club scene. And now it's sort of like a noted tradition of the area. Um, so that's just like a, a quick overview of what traditional arts are. It's very broad. It's often connected to culture. It's often connected to place. And at MSAC, we support uh, traditional arts through a number of different efforts. The, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to make it seem hierarchical, but the most intense focus on the traditional arts is through the program. And that's the program that I uh, direct with my excellent colleague, Ryan Coons, whom you'll meet in a minute. But we also want to make it very clear that MSAC supports the traditional arts across all of our programs. So if you have some sort of traditional practice that you're involved in, it's not as if Maryland Tradition is the only place you can go. You also can apply for grants for organizations. You can apply for a creativity grant, for uh, an independent artist award to be part of our presenting and touring roster. And you can even go into non-grant opportunities like the cultural documentation work that we do and Maryland traditions. And we're hoping to cover all of that today. Um, but before we get into the nuts and bolts, uh, which we will do, and we'll give you contact information, and you'll be able to talk to us, and that'll be great. Um, I'd love to take a little bit of time just to introduce each of you to each of us who are involved in the traditional arts at MSAC and to talk a little bit about our backgrounds. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, we'll start off with Ryan. Ryan, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chad, and hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as Chad said, I'm Ryan Coons. I'm the new Folk Life Specialist at Maryland Traditions for the Maryland State Arts Council. This is, I think, just coming up on my fifth month on the job, so it's just getting over a steep learning curve. Um, I actually was born and raised in Carroll County in Maryland and grew up about 10 minutes away from where I live now, so it's a wonderful homecoming for me to be able to do this work. Uh, I grew up in a traditional Celtic and Nordic acoustic music family band, traditional Irish music, Swedish music. And when there's not a pandemic on, we still play around the region quite regularly. Uh, I actually grew up attending the traditional arts summer school Common Ground on the Hill, which is still based out of McDaniel College in Westminster, Maryland. And through that program, I've met a wide swath of tradition bearers and cultural workers from around the world and those connections and the contacts that I made there drew me into the academic study of ethnomusicology 
which tends to look at music and dance performance as cultural phenomena. And those relationships that I developed through Common Ground facilitated a series of academic degrees and a bunch of ethnographic research projects, uh, perhaps most importantly, which included uh, more than a decade long project that I'm actually still involved in collaborating with a Muscogee Creek American Indian community at their invitation to study the music and dance of their ritual traditions. Uh, this project involved a pretty large archival component, which led me to doing the work to become an archivist uh, and later a certified archivist through the Academy of Certified Archivists. You, you never quite know what the routes you're going to end up going. And I've also been fortunate to work with and learn from a number of additional communities, such as uh, in South Africa and Mississippi, to document the uses of music and dance during the anti-apartheid movement and the, uh, the civil rights movement here an international community of musicians centering around a relatively recently invented musical instrument called the Bode Dulcimer, and also a project to document the lives and musical repertoires of the folks in what we call traditional music genres who self-identify as LGBT. So within my work here at MSAC as the folk life specialist, uh, my goal was really to facilitate relationships and community building between institutions and tradition bearers and culture workers in order to make the institutional resources that we and other partner institutions have and our funding and our networks more visible and much more easily accessible to the folks who want to be able to connect with them. Thanks, Chad. Thank you, Ryan. Next slide. Emily. Oh gosh, I have to follow Ryan. <laughs> uh, I'm Emily Sallenberger. I'm a program director at the State Arts Council as well. Uh, and uh, between myself and my colleague, Laura Weiss, who's not on the call right now, um, we uh, kind of co-direct the Grants for Organization program, the Creativity Grant, the Independent Artist Award, and the Presenting and Touring Network, which includes a grant opportunity for presenting organizations, along with a touring roster that's for um, independent artists and collaborative groups um, so uh, that have um, experience touring across the state. Um, so uh, I don't have the extensive background in traditions like Ryan and Chad, but uh, my background is um, in the visual arts, a general visual arts background and um, master's in arts administration, which has led me uh, to doing some fundraising work before I came to the State Arts Council. So I worked for three different organizations in Baltimore City, um, Maryland Art Place, Baltimore Clayworks, and then the City's Arts Council, Baltimore Office of Promotion of the Arts, where I fundraise um, for for all three organizations before taking this role. So um, I have more of a generalized background and I um, rely heavily on Ryan and Chad for their expertise in the, uh, in the traditions realm. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Okay, looks like I'm up next. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lillian Jacobson, the Regional Events Planner at MSAC. I have been in this role since December. Um, and under normal circumstances, I would be working with Chad and Ryan to coordinate site visits for the Heritage Awards and other programs. My background is also as a visual artist. I am a painter. And yes, I will probably be in touch with you um, as events start to happen again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lillian. Uh, my name is Chad once again. And uh, my job title is Maryland State Folklorist. That's probably a curious title to some folks on the line. But uh, in the United States, we have had uh, full-time state folklorists for a little over 40 years, I want to say. Uh, this came from an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts at that time to be supportive, more supportive of traditional arts across the country at the state level. And by providing uh, seed money for the hiring of state folklorists across the country, at that time. Most states have continued along with uh, the employment of state folklorists. Uh, Maryland and Tennessee were the very first states to hire a state folklorists in the same year, 1974. And Maryland has had a state folklorist in all of the years since. Tennessee's program kind of dropped out for a couple of years and then came back. So that makes Maryland the longest continuously running state 
traditional arts program in the country. And we're, we're proud of that fact. And we hope that we do good work and, and service to folks. Uh, I work most closely with Ryan. Uh, he and I are kind of hip to hip on uh, Maryland Traditions grant making activities, as well as our cultural documentation and archival activities, getting to know new artists and learning about where they're from and uh, what they do. Um, I come from a folklore studies background. I did my graduate work at Indiana University, earned a PhD in that subject, and my um, research focus was on uh, contemporary traditional storytelling practices in Ireland. I was really interested about how a lot of the old tales were being translated into broadcast and now digital media. So I did some field work uh, in country back in 2013 and wrote my dissertation on that subject. These days, it's, it's, it's all about administration and kind of trying to identify and clean up processes to make it easier for all of our constituents out in Maryland to, to, <laughs> to access our funds. I, always, I like to say that my job is to reduce the distance between traditional artists and money. That is a, a prime sort of motivation for me. Uh, but there's so much else that, that we do and I am humbled and always very pleased to be working with such excellent, excellent colleagues that are as are on the call right now. Um, so uh, we're gonna kind of go into the next section of the presentation, but um, before we do, uh, are there any questions at all about who we are and where we're from and what inspires us? Okay. So the name of the program that Ryan and I run together is Maryland Traditions. And uh, it is made up of a number of granting programs. Uh, right now, I am going to tell you about a couple of the granting programs that are specifically set aside to fund the activities of individuals. So uh, the Folk Life Apprenticeship is one of our grants. It's uh, the oldest grant, actually, in the Maryland Traditions program. It's been going since 2000 four, and it is a $5,000 grant to support traditional arts education. It goes to two-person teams every year, and we have funds to support 10 two-person teams per year. And uh, the only real requirement is that we have a master and a learner artist, and that some form of traditional arts is being handed down through that teaching relationship. The Folk Life Apprenticeship application is, is open to all Maryland residents or I should say residents who have been here for at least six months, that's the cutoff. And uh, these, these grants, like all our grants, are judged by a panel of experts in the field. And um, the, the money goes out up front and is set aside to kind of fund that educational experience. The Folk Life Apprenticeship also comes with a media component. So all recipients of this grant have a chance to uh, visit with us or really for us to visit with them. When the pandemic's not on, we go out into the world, into their studios, into their workspaces, into their performance areas. And uh, we bring a team of photographers and audio recordists and we document their work together. And uh, that work uh, is used later on in our marketing materials. It also goes, goes into our archives, which Ryan will tell you about a little bit later. Uh, but again, it's, um, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, a great grant. It's not a huge, huge amount of money, um, but uh, it, it is competitive. It seems to get a lot of interest from people out uh, around the state. And it is on a personal level, so much fun to work with. Um, I have learned more in five years at Maryland Traditions than I probably did in graduate school about the traditional arts writ large, just because of the, the diversity of folks who are at work here in Maryland uh, doing great stuff. Uh, the Heritage Award is sort of, uh, it's like our Lifetime Achievement Award in the traditional arts. It also is a $5,000 grant offered once a year. In fact, nominations will be opening up later this summer, maybe early fall. Uh, and uh, we give out three Heritage Awards each year. And we give them out, uh, we give one award out in each of three categories. So there's one given to a person or a small group of people. There's one given to a place and there's one given to a tradition, generally speaking. So um, we, uh, we don't put any restrictions on this funding. So those who receive the Heritage Award can, can use that $5,000 to do whatever they want. It's, it's more like a recognition of work that's already been completed rather than an expectation that future work will be completed. Our current Heritage Award winners uh, in the person category 
Uh, this year we awarded uh, Rock Howland, who is a mountain clogger from Carroll County. We awarded in the place category, uh, the uh, traditional homelands of the Nassau Waywash Band of Indians. And uh, they are historically located in the region now known as Dorchester County on the Eastern shore. And our tradition award this year went generally to the black storytelling tradition, which has thrived in Maryland through the efforts of organizations, organizations like the Griot Circle of Maryland and the uh, National Association of Black Storytellers. So that's just a quick taste of two of the grants for individuals in Maryland traditions. And I'll turn it over to Emily. Great, thanks Chad. Um, the creativity grant is next. Uh, this is uh, going into year two of the creativity grant program. Last year was its first full year um, and we saw that it's very popular and very competitive. Uh, so very excited about uh, FY21 programs um, and applications that are coming through. So with the creativity grant, this will show up in the individual opportunities along with the um, opportunities for organizations, but specifically for individuals, um, it's focusing on project or program-based uh, work. So thinking ahead about any kind of uh, project that connects with community relevance and, and public accessibility. And part of the reason we have this, this grant opportunity is really to fund those um, those projects that are going to connect with your community quickly and get funding out pretty quickly. So the, the grants are between $1,000 and $3,500. Applications are accepted on a rolling basis throughout the year. Uh, they're reviewed monthly. So, um, so every month through the fifth of the month, we will collect um, 30 days or, or whatever the monthly allotment of um, at, at the fifth of the month, send it to a panel for review on the by the 15th, um, and then we uh, turn around those award notifications by the end of that month. So we're constantly um, awarding uh, programs and projects for individuals along with organizations within the creativity grant. The next one is the Independent Artist Award. Um, and this is kind of uh, the opposite. Instead of looking forward ahead at, at programs and projects with the Creativity Grant, the Independent Artist Award is really an award um, similar to the Heritage Award and, and, um, and recognizing achievement in a particular discipline. So um, we made some changes to the Independent Artist Award um, the past year. So we, we actually just closed it um, this past Friday for the second year focusing on visual artists. So looking ahead next year, we will focus on literary artists and the year after that will be performing artists. So um, three primary categories that go on a three year cycle. Um, and the way the awards are broken down are by region. So we have five regions um, that we recognize in the state of Maryland. That's the Baltimore Metro, the Washington Metro, um, Western Maryland, Southern Maryland, and the Eastern Shore. So we um, we have panels that are associated with those um, regions and um, review the application by region as well. So then there are $2,000 and $10,000 awards by region. Uh, and then those that receive the $10,000 award are pooled together into another state award of $15,000. And there's up to two awards of $15,000. So um, for an independent artist or a collaborative group, um, there's up to $25,000 total for that particular award, which is um, pretty amazing uh, to, to say the least for that particular program. Um, and both myself and my colleague, Laura, um, oversee both the Creativity Grant and the Independent Artist Award. So if you have any questions about those two, you can reach out to us. And similarly with the presenting and touring roster, the roster itself is a listing of, of touring artists um, that, that lives on our website. Um, and it's really, you know, artists that have the capacity or interested in touring across the state. Um, and then corresponding, there is a grant um, program for presenting organizations to hire artists off of that roster. So it's a really nice collaborative program with presenting institution or organization um, and, and the artist. So the idea is that there's collaboration between the, the presenting organization and, and you as a touring roster artist um, to then work together to apply for that funding for them to, to hire artists. And that's what I've got for now. <laughs> 
Thanks, Emily. Next slide, please. Um, maybe we'll just take a beat for questions. We're throwing a lot of arts admin ideas, vocab, et cetera, at you. In fact, just jump in whenever. If someone has a comment or a question, we'll happily take those. Okay. Uh, so the traditional arts are also well supported at MSAC at the organizational level. And this is gonna look a little bit different um, uh, through Maryland Traditions, which again is the uh, program that I run with Ryan. Uh, we grant annually to the Folk Life Network. Those are grants of between $10,000 and $50,000. Uh, so the Folk Life Network is a very interesting beast. It's, a, it's, it's new, it's new this year, as a matter of fact. Um, after, after many years of, of granting on a discretionary basis to organizations around the state doing traditional arts work, we finally formalized those grants into a, a single program with clear guidelines and expectations and all the rest of it. So starting this month, as a matter of fact, we have eight regional folk life centers around the state. Uh, we are um, funding each of them in a particular region with the expectation that because they're located in a place, they have a better understanding of the types of traditional arts that might be happening in that place. And as we all know, uh, Maryland is so incredibly diverse, you might find things happening in Allegheny County that would be completely foreign to people in Somerset or Wicomico County. And the same is true going between, say, Baltimore City and St. Mary's County. Uh, so the strategy is basically to have kind of a, a traditional art satellite in each region to be really connecting with, with people, with the community, figuring out what their needs are and uh, planning and programming accordingly. Um, we are trying to get the Folk Life Network into a shape as well where they can start to serve as resource centers so that if we get an inquiry from somebody in um, Montgomery County, uh, we would say, well, you know, a great place to, to think about how to uh, share or amplify your art form would be um, Sandy Spring Museum, which is our regional folk life center in Montgomery County. Uh, the staff there is always really open. They just hired a new folk life specialist as well. Uh, and uh, the idea is that, that folks can get help locally as well as on the state level. Um, and that's it. I'm going to pass it over to Emily to talk about the GFO program. All right, great, thanks. Um, so the Grants for Organization program is, is the largest uh, um, at the State Arts Council. So we're funding um, arts organizations across the state and it's, and it's funding their general operations. So really anything from your rent, if you have a facility, to the people that, um, that are staff members, um, to all the programming, um, it's, it's really a, a flexible, um, grant award, uh, we're looking at organizations that um, have a budget amount of $50,000 and above really to, to be in this program. Um, there are a couple of different steps when it, when it comes to joining this program um, and it involves um, an intent to apply along with applications and there's two reportings for each uh, fiscal year. Um, so it's, um, there's a little bit of work there, uh, and I'm here to help you through that if you think you're, you're a good candidate for the, for the Grants for Organization program, but, uh, the funding is really based on, on your budget. There's a formula in place. So instead of applying for, you know, $10,000 or $50,000, it's really, um, it's a streamlined formula that is applied to every single arts organization across the state, no matter their discipline, if you're, you know, um, a small organization that might be $75,000 all the way up to multi-million dollar organizations. Um, so there's there's a specific formula um, base that we use uh, for that funding amount. Um, there is a specific discipline category for the folk and traditional arts, and I'm the point person for that. And I rely again on Chad and Ryan to help with their expertise if there's any questions there. Um, but it's, it's a really great program um, to be involved in. And, and then there's um, uh, an application every year um, and a three-year cycle. And there's some ins and outs of, of this, but really um, keep in mind that it, it's general operating funds for um, organizations that are, are 50,000 and above. Um, if you're not um, above that kind of threshold um, budget-wise, the creativity grant um, is also an option for organizations um, and one of the reasons the creativity grant was um, 
was developed was because of the intense amount of not I want to say intense amount, but more work with the grants for organization program, whereas the creativity grant is a more simplified um, and is more accessible for smaller organizations that might be uh, volunteer run or um, have one staff person. So um, again, I'm here to talk through the ins and outs and, and where you might fall um, in either one of those categories if you're representing an organization. Hi, um, this is uh, Barbara. I just have a quick question about the folk life, the regional folk life centers. Where are they located on the Eastern shore? We have uh, one located in Salisbury, Maryland, that is at the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art. And wonderful place. Yes, yeah, it's a wonderful spot. And uh, that relationship actually goes back to 2002. Oh, wow. We have just funded a, a second organization but the news is extremely new, and um, I am reasonably certain that they've got the news that they have been funded, but I don't know for sure, Barbara, so I can't, I can't say the name of the other Eastern Shore organization, but there is one, and there is a press release in the works, so it won't be long to make that news public. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So you can sort of see, you're starting to see the ways that the traditional arts sort of interweave throughout our staff. And you've got Ryan and I who are just hyper overeducated and uh, spent all this time in graduate school and, and try to serve as a resource to Emily, to Laura, to other program directors who, who have responsibility for serving the traditional arts in their own programs. So um, that's, I guess, one way of thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> and um, this is uh, just a little bit of information on uh, who to contact. Um, so for Maryland Traditions, it's again, Ryan and me. And I've been spending a lot of time talking about the grant opportunities in Maryland traditions, but there is quite a bit else that we do. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to tell you a little bit about those efforts. Okay, this is the part where I get excited, even more excited. Um, so as Chad said, there are a bunch of other things that we do besides funnel money as quickly as possible out the door. And one of those is the Maryland Folklife Archives. The archives were founded in 2014. And we're very fortunate because they were actually founded in collaboration with the Department of Special Collections of the Library of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC. Um, which is to say that the archives have a home and a climate controlled environment. They're not going to degrade, be damaged, they're safe, they are accessible. It's, it's an ideal situation. Um, the Maryland Folklife Archives contain the cultural and historic materials that the currently known as Maryland Traditions Program and its predecessor, the Maryland Folklife Program, have generated since 1974 and even a few things before that. So we're talking state folklorist materials, field research materials, tradition bearers and cultural workers materials from across the state to give you a very small taste of the kind of stuff and the cultures that are represented here. Uh, for example, American Indian tribal peoples in Maryland, land-based traditions such as hunting, trapping, fishing, crabbing, sailing, visual arts such as Norwegian rose mailing, rug making, pinata making, bladesmithing, painted screens, dance and music traditions such as Appalachian clogging, Indian Kuchipudi and Bharatnatyam dance, African-American Jubilee gospel music, Colombian Vallenato, Persian percussion, West African Mandan Kora music, Beijing opera, Korean Samul Nori, Baltimore club, everything, everything, everything. It's glorious. It's also sometimes really confusing. <laughs> you find something and you have no idea what on earth it is. Um, as the folklore specialist for Maryland Traditions, though, part of my job duties include having oversight of the archives in collaboration with Beth Saunders, who's the curator and head of special collections over at UMBC. So because they are housed at UMBC, these collections are available to anyone and everyone. And of course, there's a pandemic on, so who knows what's going to happen next, no one really does. But to make these materials accessible, especially during the pandemic, we're currently engaged in a series of digitization projects of uh, AV, physical materials, papers and such. And among the things that we're able to do, uh, my colleagues in Special Collections and I are available to deliver various presentations on both the materials that we've got within the archives or on how to use archives and primary sources or on related topics for schools, for universities and colleges, for other groups. So please be in touch with me if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, 
at the Fartcliff Archives, we're currently working towards the goal of what's called shared stewardship. And this is a collections management model in which the people and or the communities who are represented in the collections share authority over the collections. Um, Pablo, thank you for your question. I will find that URL and pop it into the chat in one moment so you know where we're actually located. Um, shared stewardship ensures that the communities who are within the collections decide how they want to be described and represented, and most importantly, how those materials can be used uh, in ways that communities deem appropriate. This is perhaps uh, most easily visible in materials that derive from indigenous communities in terms of cultural, cult culturally appropriate use. So if you or someone you know is interested in uh, learning more about the cultural materials that uh, relate to you or to your community in the archives. And if you're interested in discussing shared stewardship, do please let me know. Those are conversations that I'm excited to get deeper into the weeds with. Um, as you see on the slideshow, we also have social media channels, uh, which also come under my purview. We have a Facebook and an Instagram social media accounts. Uh, please do follow us on there. They are both at Maryland Traditions, one word. So in addition to, of course, publishing the various annual calls for the funding applications and the award nominations, through these social media accounts, we want to try to build essentially community, build a network between the traditional artists, the cultural workers in the state, and the institutions and their audiences anywhere and everywhere that we can. Um, we are and will be featuring content about past grantees, past awardees, highlighting the various traditions that now call Maryland home or have called Maryland home for centuries or millennia, uh, sharing various finds from the Folklife Archives. Um, I have a reputation at Special Collections at UMBC for being the person who laughs the most, and it's usually because of the silly stuff I find in the archives. For example, um, Chad's ultimate predecessor, George Carey, the first state folklorist, wrote a report very early in his tenure on the job and signed it posthumously because of all the work he had doing had been doing it had killed him and it took me a while to figure out that he hadn't actually died um, so if you are interested in learning more about any of these things do please visit us at maryland traditions on facebook and instagram lillian would you like to talk about site visits i was looking for the unmute button yes um so again once um guidelines allow for site visits. I will contact people who have um, been awarded with a heritage award or with an apprenticeship award um, to visit. And we will go and photograph and document again for the archives. But if there is any other um, event or anything you would like to share, please contact any of us. Our emails are on there. and. Right now, virtual events, please. We have um, an online, what is it called? A page, <laughs> I guess. I can't think of the specific word, but we have a page on our website for virtual events. And I know Amelia is on the call, so maybe she can put that in. And that is really for every arts discipline, but including traditional arts. And then one last bit for me, um, these site visits that Lillian's describing play a part of a larger thing that Chad and I and various other folks who are contra contracted to MSAC do called field work, um, which is honestly one of my favorite parts about this thing called folk life. It's awesome because it means that we get to go to where people are and learn from them about what they do. Uh, and as Chad and Lillian both uh, alluded to, this can also of often involve video teams, photographers, recorders, recordists, um, and the materials that are captured through these various recording means are placed into the Maryland Folklife Archives, which is one of the reasons why there's so much there, but they're also um, used in some of our public-facing advertising for programs, for funding, uh, but again, it, 
I, my favorite part of it is the fact that we actually get to connect with the artists, learn what they're doing and bring to them our programming and just learn from them how we can better serve them. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, again, there's our contact information for the Maryland Traditions Program. Uh, next slide, please, Lillian. I think we're going to be turning it to Emily. Other ways, um, other programs to support traditional arts. Oh, it's Barbara, yeah. Hi, sorry, Ryan, it's Barbara with a, just a very specific question. I, I've been reading through the um, extremely well-written finding aid on the UMBC website. Is that is that your work? Finding aids, no. If you're re talking about the the, was it the lib guide, the research guide, the very it's, much. It's it's to the archive. Yes. It's quite, it, it's quite good. So if one had a specific request, one would contact you. Yes, please. To... Okay, beautiful. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Emily. Well, I think I've gone over all four of these programs. Um, my contact information is here. Um, since we all are working from home, email is best right now that I'm not checking my office line quite as much. Um, but are there any questions that I can help answer right now when it comes down to the Creativity Grant, Independent Artist Award, presenting and touring, or the grants for organizations? Okay. So maybe Lillian, let's flow into the next uh, slide here, which I think is going to be Q and A. Yes. Uh, so just uh, one more reminder of the broaden the breadth of the traditional arts. Uh, we are supporting community-based living cultural traditions handed down by example or word of mouth. One more image example. This is uh, Captain Ted Daniels and his stepson Ryan repairing the dredge net on a skipjack in Somerset County. This also very much falls within the type of traditional art that we support. It also points to the fact that um, we are supporting cultural expressions that might not be typically identified as art, but which certainly have aesthetic components uh, and, and so fall within the bounds of our program. I did see a question in chat there. Let me have a look at um, what we have. Carrie Hollihan, hi Carrie, is asking, what are the deadlines for the grants other than the creativity grant? Okay, so I can certainly start with um, Maryland Traditions. Uh, the Folklife Network will be coming due. I need to check my calendar. Thanks for keeping me honest. Um, the applications open up in fall and um, they are due in November, November 15th is the due date for Folklife Network applications, uh, but these are continuing grants for identified regional Folklife Centers, so they're not, they're not really competitive. They sort of function in the same way that we fund County Arts Councils, which is that once the organization is identified, they sort of continue to serve as a resource center. Um, but for the Heritage Award, we are gonna be opening nominations uh, in, I wanna say early September or August. Just one sec. Okay, so on September 1st, uh, the Heritage Award nominations will open and uh, it's public. You, you actually don't have to live in Maryland to nominate somebody for a Heritage Award, but the award has to go to a person, place, or tradition located in Maryland. And uh, the deadline for Heritage Award nominations is October the 15th. Again, that's October 15th. And then for the Folklife Apprenticeship, which again is the Folklife Education Grant between a master and a learner artist, uh, applications open on December 1st. And they will be due on January 15th. So it's a good six week length of time to apply there. Uh, and Emily, how about for the other? Sure. Um, so 
with the uh, grants for organization uh, program, the um, for new organizations that are not currently in the program, um, intent to apply will be due on September 15th. And then um, November 15th would be a full application. Um, and if you're already in the program, you would be hearing from myself or Laura with where, if you're a November 15th or a December 15th deadline um, to renew your application for the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, when it comes to the presenting and touring roster, those applications are actually open on a rolling basis. So if you want to apply to be on the roster, you can access that now um, and they are reviewed quarterly. Similarly, if you um, are working with a presenting organization who's interested in, in applying for a grant to hire somebody from the roster, those are also open on a rolling basis for um, applications and reviewed quarterly. Uh, and then the Independent Artist Award, um, like I said, it just closed for visual artists um, just last Friday. So we will be looking at um, next summer for the open um, opening and, and closing deadline of probably close to July, um, end of July again for literary artists only. And then the following year we'll be presenting um, or performing artists. I think that was everything. Uh, hi, this is Pablo. Um, the, for the uh, touring and artists, is there, um, I'm sure there is, is there a, like a, a list of requirements or to be eligible to uh, apply to be on the roster? There is a, it's a short application. So we ask for, you know, if you've had any experience touring, um, some attachments to work samples, um, if you have a example contract um, that you use as an artist, um, some promotional materials, but really, uh, we're looking to build that roster, you know, of of artists that have been touring. But also, if you have an interest in touring and you have to get those materials together um, to consider, then you just will review um, and and approve you uh, through either the a panel or um, internally by a staff member. Oh, thanks. And also, do all uh, like I have a a band that I I work with. Not every single member is from Maryland, but most are. Mm -hmm. Does that make a difference? Yes, that's a great question. 50% uh, of a group have to reside in Maryland. Okay. So as long as you're at that point, you're good. Cool. Great Thanks. question. Good to see you. Thanks, you too. We have a question from Hannah Miller. Can we send the slides out by email? Uh, this webinar is being recorded. And so you will have access to the recording, which you can get by emailing Dana Parsons, who is our professional development director who introduced the session today. Uh, her email is in the chat box and I'll say it out. Oh my gosh, I wrote it wrong in the chat box. So her email is dana.parsons at maryland.gov. And so I have corrected that in the chat box. And once again, out loud, dana.parsons at maryland.gov for recording access. And another one from Pablo, do the Folk Life Centers offer grants um, on their own? Um, they don't tend to, they don't tend to. Uh, but again, we have three new ones this year, so that may be something that they end up choosing to do. Uh, they really serve uh, in very unique capacities based on the needs of their particular regions. Uh, in Allegheny County, where Frostburg State University serves as our regional folk life center, there's a strong focus on public pro programming. So uh, there's an annual festival, as well as a traditional arts storefront. Uh, there's also a good amount of field research, field work, because it's housed at a university and our contact there will incorporate some of that field work into her class curriculums with undergraduates. Um, whereas if you go down to a place like Sandy Spring Museum, for example, they're rolling out a lot of initiatives right now to help people with the grant making process. Folks that might be new to that or have questions uh, and they have a particular focus on grant making in the arts. So they've been running sessions lately on uh, giving technical assistance in that way. Um, and then the Ward Museum again would be a, a sort of a different ball of wax based on the folks that they're working with in Dorchester, Wicomico, Worcester, Somerset counties. And they do all have schedules of events for the public, um, all of all of them are having programming open to everyone in, in some way, shape or form. Chad, I had a question about the apprenticeship program. Yes. 
So um, the the next deadline will be in December. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen, obviously, with the pandemic. Do, um, do you anticipate any change to the program if most things still have to be done virtually? Right. So thanks, Carrie. Uh, the the December date, December first, is actually when applications open, and then the deadline won't be until January fifteenth for the folk life apprenticeship. Uh, but across all of our grant programs, uh, as long as they're taking place during the pandemic, we are looking for grantees, we're looking for applicants to align their applications with the governor's roadmap, road, roadmap to recovery document, which kind of lays out in plain terms um, what needs to happen uh, in any kind of activity for it to be considered safe uh, from a public health perspective. And then also for our applicants to be thinking about what's true in their own jurisdictions, because the state guidelines are are at one level of public health. And then, you know, in Prince George's County, for example, those restrictions might be a little bit tighter. Uh, so we're asking for folks to be aware of um, what those guidelines are at the local level and to kind of align that with the applications that they're making to the Arts Council. Right now, there's really been no talk of um, of, of, of doing away temporarily with any programs. We're always looking for ways to allow the funding to continue, uh, even as we have these restrictions in place. Now, if I may, I have a follow-up question to that um, about the folk like archives um, that Ryan was, was describing. Um, is there a way to access those materials um, in anticipation of doing something like the apprenticeship program? Um, that could kind of feed into the, both the application and also sort of support the, the learning between the master and the apprentice? So I love that idea. Um, thank you for your question, Carrie. The difficulty here is, of course, that, you know, the Folk Life Archives are housed at UMBC, which is great. Um, and during a pandemic, of course, everything's haywire. UMBC Special Collections is putting to is still in the process of finalizing its um, staff facility access protocols, um, and as we're working through that, that you know that's a document of like who's going to be where, when, who's allowed, how many people are allowed in the room or the building or the facility, etc. At one time, the stuff that so many institutions are going through. So the difficulty with your request is time. Uh, we are able to facilitate access. We're still ironing out all of those details, uh, which is why I'm being vague and my apologies for that. I don't like that. Um, but if the more time you can give us to be able to access this stuff, because we would probably have to be digitizing it for you at the moment, looks like what we're going to be doing, uh, the better. Um, as my colleagues in special collections move in, to the facility mid late August, we'll have a better sense of what those protocols and timelines look like. So sooner the better. Great, thank you very much. Of course. Another piece, Carrie, is that if you have an idea for an apprenticeship, uh, but you don't necessarily have the name of somebody in Maryland whom you'd like to work with, you can always just reach out to us. And perhaps over time, we've encountered somebody who would make a good fit or we know of an organization doing a certain kind of work and we could do an email introduction and, and help in that way. And that really goes for everybody on the call. Uh, for, for, for those of you with an idea, that's basically all you need to drop us a line. We're, we'd be happy to talk further. So it's 3.55 and I know that we, um, we, we wanna wrap up by four and that we've got a couple of, um, a couple of things we like to do at the end of every meeting. Uh, so, so hearing no further questions, let's maybe transition into that. And uh, so I'll turn it over to Lillian to take us out. Thank you. Yes, so let's take the next five minutes or so to reflect on this webinar. MSAC staff is committed to improving our processes and that can only happen with input from you. So um, feel free to put in the chat or to turn on your mic and let us know what was helpful about the webinar today and what could have been better. Any comments are welcome. I will also um, put that link in the chat um, 
at that link, you can put ideas for future professional development sessions, and we use those as well. So while I'm putting that link, please feel free to let us know again, what was helpful, what could have been better? Well, I'll just say I appreciate, um, sorry, I'm gonna turn my video off because I'm not really video ready, sorry. Um, <laughs> I will say that I really like that you had specific program information for the traditions program, but also how they um, fit into the larger MSAC grant um, programming. So that was really helpful. I appreciate putting everything into context um, so you have a sort of a larger perspective on, on what the MSAC is doing. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for, for holding the, actually, Maryland State Arts Council holds a lot of these type of events with all different staff and this is great. But especially opening up uh, several points in time during presentation for questions is, is really useful too. I'm glad, thank you. It was also really great to hear the backgrounds of all of your team members, because it gives a better idea of if we have specific questions who we should talk to and also what resources they have from their professional training that we could access. That was really great. Thank you, Carrie. Does anyone have a comment on what could have been better or maybe what else you would like to see? Anything you'd like to learn more about in maybe a future webinar? Hi, this is uh, Monique Walker with the Charles County Arts Alliance. I would um, love for a few, in a future webinar to see uh, or hear from previous grant recipients their, and just to learn their experiences with the grant process and you know, what it is that they're doing and how they're doing it. That's a great idea. You cut out a little at the end for me, um, but what I heard, and I'm going to say for Amelia, who's taking notes, is the idea of having um, a chance where we can hear from the previous grant recipients um, about their process experience after they were awarded the grant and some more context on that. So thank you for that comment. I'd like to follow up with that briefly, um, just so that you're aware, um, you know, again, with the social media platforms that Maryland Traditions uses, uh, that is something that we're starting to, trying to start to roll out. Uh, and August 17th will be the first of, I think, six of a, of a six day uh, campaign series of guest invited posts to different ways you can talk about it um, by a former grantee, um, Stacy Stube, who received a folklife apprenticeship grant this past year, it just finished up with the turn of the fiscal cycle. Um, and she will be talking about part of that. And thank you very much for letting us know that because I will work to include that more often into our social media. We also got um, a comment from Virginia asking, what about a virtual tour of holdings in the archives? I love it. Oh, I, love I it. second that motion. Sorry, that's brilliant. I love it. Once we can actually get in, I'll start working on that. I would also love to hear about the work that both Chad and Ryan do in terms of field work and site visits. So there, well, field work in particular, because there's a tradition in um, Chinese folk songs of going out into the countryside and taking recordings and collecting lyrics and um, cataloging folk instruments and things like that. Um, and I'm sure that there's um, similar kinds of processes for all the different kinds of traditional arts that are taking place here in Maryland. And it'd be great to see the work that's going on. Um, if you can put something online, obviously we, we can't be there in person, but um, I'd love to know more about that. That's great. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, 
I noticed that it's 4 p.m. So I'm just going to move to the next slide. Um, if you have more ideas, please reach out, um, put them in the chat, or you can email us with the email address on the screen, msac.commerce at maryland.gov. Okay, so here, um, if you want to explore and register for other Envision offerings, you can see a full list of events there. And I will put a copy of that link into the chat. Okay. Oh, and I'm seeing some more thank yous. Thank you, I'm glad it was informative. So again, Thank you, and to learn about similar topics, news, keep in touch, please sign up for our mailing list. Hannah's asking if we can have a list of attendees. Hannah, if you email us, um, I'm not sure if we're able to share that. Does anyone on the call know? Uh, that would be a Dana Parsons question, I think. Uh, but she, she would certainly have the answer. She had to step out a little early from this meeting, but I'm sure she'll get back to you if you, if you uh, email her. Thank you. I'm going to put her email address in one more time for you. So yes, thank you all so much. Thank you. This has been great. Really appreciate your attendance today. Good seeing you all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Virginia. Have a good day.